You heard about my old back and legs. Uh, I'm sitting on a bar stool because I'm old. And uh, so my favorite verse, now that I have to carry a bar stool around with me when I preach, is a, a, new, a new verse, a New Testament verse that means a lot. And that is, it says, Jesus sat down and said. <laughs> it is a pleasure to be back with you. It's an honor to be here. Uh, again, today, I told several people uh, this last week what a remarkable church this is, that, uh, and they said, why? And I, I told them, I said, well, I'll tell you what's, the first thing that's remarkable about this church is that I have been preaching now for 45 years, and I have never in all those years been asked to preach at a church for an hour. <laughs> much, <laughs> much, much less be, be asked back. <laughs> so all I can say is that, you know, I, I hang out with Presbyterians, and, and Presbyterians, when I preach for them, there's usually a guy in the sound booth, he's got a gun in one hand and a stopwatch in the other one. And I'm just saying, may your tribe increase many fold throughout the earth. <laughs> and if, if you were here last week, uh, you may recall that as soon as I, I finished preaching and I sat down, Pastor Tim came up, and uh, the very first thing he said is, where's your final exam? Because he was used to that, being a former student of mine at the, at the cemetery, seminary. And uh, so uh, here I am. I'm back. And I've come back with the final. But uh, I really want you to do well on this final exam. And so what I've done is I, I want you to know there will be five questions on the final exam. And I have given you those five questions, two places in your bulletin. If you look, you will find them. Now, and now how about that? It, isn't it great when a, when a teacher will give you the final exam questions? I hid them in two places. If you'll look on the left-hand side, they're hidden under the family questions or whatever, the see final exam. And if you look on the right-hand side, there are, uh, you'll see these, questions that will be um, up and coming. And I want you to do well. Most seminary students I've had over the 20 plus years I taught full time uh, feared my finals. And so they would pray hard. And so I think it's appropriate for us to pray. Let's, let's, let's pray together. Our gracious God, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, we ask you to take your word. Renew our minds. Inflame our hearts. Yes, Lord, equip us to answer correctly these questions about your amazing love for us in Christ. Not just for deeper understanding but so that our deeper awareness of who you are and what you've done for us and your son will change us and will bring you the honor that you alone deserve. We ask in the name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. Now, for those of you who were here last week or were not, uh, we'll begin with a review, and that's the first major point that you see on your outline. You, you should have received uh, what are called the final exam cheat sheet. Did you get something in your bulletin? Okay, well, that's your actual cheat sheet and it's going to be open book. So, so, uh, so you, can, you can use that. And I, be, I began last week uh, with a pop quiz asking you to think about how you would answer the question, what is the gospel? Now, the reason that I ask that question 
is not because most Christians uh, give wrong answers to that question, but because when most people answer the question, what is the gospel, their answers are incomplete. They're not wrong. They're just not full-orbed. They're not fully biblical. And we also learned last week that the gospel is, it's simple enough for a child to understand. I mean, the correct answer to the question could be one of the children who were just dismissed who would say, okay, and I said, what is the gospel pop quiz? And they raise their hand and say, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. And I'd go A plus. That is the correct answer. But God actually calls those who are followers of Jesus to spend their lives going deeper in their understanding of God's astonishing and amazing grace and love for them. Why? Because the degree to which you understand the gospel, the degree to which you learn how to apply the deeper understanding of the gospel to your life is directly related to the degree to which you will be transformed by the gospel into the image of Christ. We saw last week that the gospel is not just a gate that we pass through one time when we're converted. Usually when people talk about that, when we were saved, and receive forgiveness of sin and eternal life. The gospel is not just a gate. It is that, that we pass through one time to be saved from sin's penalty. But the Bible teaches the gospel is also a path that we must learn to walk on every day of our lives so that we will know and so that we will experience the fullness of life. It's good news for the lost and the found that we want to study more deeply this morning. So last week, we began with a look at the meaning of this word used 75 times in the New Testament by each of these New Testament authors. Now, originally, before the time of Christ, this word translated gospel was used in the first century culture. And we saw last time that it was originally used to describe a public, a military, a, a political event, usually a victory of a Roman king or a Roman emperor who would announce the good news that he is their king, that's who he is, and what he has done is he has conquered his enemies and their enemies, and the response when people heard it was, Yahoo, good news, it was great joy, and it was renewed pledge of loyalty to the king. Now that's the cultural, secular context that gives rich meaning to the actual New Testament word. Therefore, at its core, the good news in the Bible, and this would be kind of the first concept, what is the gospel? The, the gospel is the good news of who God is, the real king, and what God does to deliver us from all his and our enemies, that when we realize the depth of this deliverance and the price that he paid brings astonishing joy and renewed pledges of loyalty. See the parallel between the secular and the New Testament. And so it's the good news of who God is as triune Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and what he does to deliver fallen humanity in the world from sin and all its consequences. Now today, what I want you to see, and if you'll, if you'll look at your cheat sheet over on the right-hand side, you'll see the first two major points. I want you to see what many people don't realize, and that is when the Bible describes the good news 
about who God is and what God does, it gives us two major perspectives on this gospel. And theologians and scholars and, and teachers and writers use different words. It doesn't matter, just so you understand. One is the big gospel and one is the more personal gospel that is within the big gospel. And notice the phrase that we're using here is the cosmic good news. The Bible presents the good news in a cosmic sense, in a huge sense, of what God has done to deliver the entire cosmos, key word used in the New Testament to describe this, that Paul uses over and over, is all things, all things. And then there is the personal good news. For how is this good news not only for the world, for the cosmos, but here's where it hits home. How does this good news, if I look for a subset of this, for all things, good news for me? That brings me great joy. You know, one of the things that's really interesting, and, and this has often perplexed people, because when you hear about the gospel, you usually think of the personal, the salvation gospel, but when you go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, every time you hear about the gospel, you hear about the kingdom. And you go, this is kind of confusing. We just read Mark 1. Jesus said, uh, Jesus said, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe this good news. What good news? The good news that the time is near. The good news that the kingdom of God is at hand. See? See how that's a perspective toward the gospel that is a he's talking about the cosmic gospel now the cosmic gospel is the good news about the triune god's grand scope and glorious plan and purpose to redeem and restore all things in fallen creation did you notice in our reading earlier in the worship i gave you two examples of how the apostle paul will start his New Testament letters bringing the gospel to the New Testament churches and he starts with the cosmic gospel. In Ephesians 1.10, here's Ephesians 1. He writes, the Father's plan, about the Father's plan for the fullness of time to do What? To unite, there's the word, see the two words? To unite all things in him that is Christ. And just in case, you might be wondering if it's really all things, notice, everything in heaven, everything in earth, everything that is, the cosmic good news. Now look at Paul writing to the Colossians. Does the same thing in Colossians 1. He writes, for in him, that is Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself sinners who would repent. You see that in the text? No. To reconcile to himself what? What do you see in the text? To reconcile to himself what? All things. Do you really mean all things? Yep, look what he says next. Whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Do you see this? This is called the gospel of the kingdom. This is called the cosmic gospel. This is the big gospel. It's the cosmic good news, sometimes called the magnificent acts of the triune God, the Magnalia Day, to redeem and restore God's fallen creation from sin and all its horrible consequences. Now, grasp this. This good news did not start in the first century with the story of Jesus. This good news starts in creation. 
and it's a four-act story. This gospel is a four-act drama of who God is and what God does in history to redeem and restore this broken world, subset, broken humanity, to bring everything back to Him, everything back to Him in Christ. So let's look at the story. It's like an unfolding drama. You can notice in your notes, Act 1. Did you see Act 1? In the first act, we learn how God the Father created all things, visible and invisible. Here we see, and we looked at this last time, the picture of ultimate happiness, wholeness in the world, that God created very important to see the original creation account and not just Eden, but the paradise that was in Eden as God establishing his kingdom on that place of the earth. This is the fullness of heaven on earth in paradise. But something happened. Look at Acts 2. Evil enters the story through Satan, who overthrows God's kingdom on earth by tempting Adam and Eve to sin, resulting in the fall of humanity in the world. This is why, men and women, things are not the way they're supposed to be. All things, from a biblical perspective right now, all things, hear the phrase? All things are now under God's just curse and now under Satan's rule. That's chapter 2. But the good news is that God's plan, original plan at creation to have his heaven come to earth, to have his kingdom on the earth, where all things are the way they're supposed to be, that plan would not be thwarted. We come to Act 3. In the cosmic gospel, soon after the fall, God proclaims the gospel for the first time to Satan. Do you remember this? I did the pop quiz last week. When was the gospel proclaimed for the first time in the Bible? And who preached the gospel for the first time? And to whom did he preach the gospel? To Satan. As a part of his curse on Satan for overthrowing his kingdom. You see, God then promises to send a redeemer who will defeat Satan, restore fallen humanity, restore all things and the world to be God's kingdom on earth again. Do you see the story? He will not give up on plan A. That's the good news. To make everything the way it's supposed to be. Everything. All things. And so the Old Testament then shows us how God begins to bring the kingdom back to earth. First through individuals like Adam and Noah. Then through Abraham. Then through the nation of Israel. 400 silent years in this unfolding drama of history. And then something that has never happened in history before took place in the first century. Jesus said, The time has come. I have good news. The time has come. The kingdom of God is at hand. I'm the promised one who will defeat your enemy. God is breaking through. And he's going to make all things right again. Now you see the context of the cosmic gospel. When you, when you read Jesus proclaiming the gospel as the time is near, the kingdom of God is at hand, now it makes perfect sense when you understand the cosmic nature of the gospel. But what didn't make much sense, especially to the Jews of that first century, was that how he was accomplishing God's the delivery of his people 
from God's just curse and Satan's rule. They were expecting a deliverer, like a, like a Roman emperor on steroids, to crush their enemies. So what he did shocked them. Let this sink in. It confused them horribly how this king has come to deliver them by dying in weakness on a cross. That's why Paul calls the preaching of the cross the foolishness of God. You see, it was, only, it was only by taking God's just curse for us on himself that he could satisfy God's holy justice and that he could deal a fatal blow to Satan as our enemy and restore us and restore all things by bringing God's invisible kingdom and making it visible on earth again. Then act four. Look at act four. Here we learn <clears throat> that three days, three days after he was in the tomb, he was raised from the dead. What is the meaning of Jesus' resurrection? Yes, it is true. It is good news that death has been conquered, but it was more. By his resurrection, he was proving the success of his rescue mission of not just conquering death, but inaugurating God's kingdom on earth and revealing himself, the Apostle Paul later says, as the firstborn from the dead of all of us who will soon follow him when he returns to make all things new and raises us from the dead forever. Forty days after his resurrection, Jesus ascends back to the Father, where the Father and the Son pour out the Holy Spirit. We know of that as Pentecost. And at Pentecost, God the Holy Spirit began restoring all things by creating a new humanity to indwell this new kingdom on earth. That new humanity, Paul later calls the church. It's us. And he's going to give to this new humanity the great reversal. Whereas they were cursed with a guilty standing, if they repent and believe, he's going to give them a new standing of perfect righteousness into his very holy presence like a father with a son or a daughter. He's going to give them the curse of corrupt hearts. He's going to give them a new heart with new power and new love to know and love and enjoy God and others like it's supposed to be and promise them a new world. Now the end of this chapter that we are in now do you, know you know the Bible has an actual term for the period that we are living in right now? It's called the last days. From the time of Jesus, life, death, and resurrection, and ascension, until the time of his return, this period in the New Testament that we are in is actually called the last days. And this period will end with the return of Christ and the consummation of his kingdom on earth. And here it is, where all things that were lost because of sin will finally be restored in the new heavens and the new earth forever. And in this world to come, I mean, in this world to come, we, you know, remember last week I said everybody going to heaven is making a round trip? I mean, heaven is wonderful. To die is cry. I mean, to die is gain. You know, to, to be with Christ in heaven is wonderful. But let me tell you, it's a layover. 
until Jesus returns and unites your soul with your body and gives you a new body to indwell a new earth where everything is the way it's supposed to be forever. Now, we'll stop, and I want to get you ready for the first question on your exam. Question number one. Look at the first question. You ready? I want you to do so well on this. Okay? Question number one. What are these magnificent cosmic acts the triune God has done in history? Hint, hint. Creation. Uh, the bad news, curse of all things. Redemption in Christ. Re reversing the curse. The restoration of the Spirit. The restoring of all things. Question number two, what is the big cosmic good news about God's kingdom on earth? Look, it's right there at the, at the top of your notes. The good news. Now, here's a summary of the cosmic gospel. I mean, this is good news. Remember last week I said, might even make a Presbyterian shout. The good news. I want to pull a star by it. The cosmic good news, look at the four epics. The Father's creation, ruined by humanity's sin, has been redeemed by His Son and is being restored by His Holy Spirit into the kingdom of God on earth forever. Now, before we go on to look at the personal good news, I want to share with you why this is good news and its application. You know what this means? This means that we are now living in a very unique period of history. Between the inauguration of God's kingdom on earth at the resurrection and ascension of Jesus and the outpouring of his spirit in the first century and the consummation of God's kingdom on earth when he returns to restore all things by the power of his Holy Spirit. Now, here's how this applies. Here's how even the cosmic go gospel. Philosophers would say, we have a worldview here. We have a view of life here that is deeply profound. History is not without meaning. It's not just cyclical, meaning, meaningless events. History has a purpose. God's story is still being written. You are not a cosmic accident. We'll see in just a moment that part of the good news, God didn't just create all things. God created you specifically, uniquely, at this time in his story. And do you know what that means? That means the only way for you to make true sense out of your story in this life is to understand how your story fits into God's story. And with so many acts in the divine drama of history already, already unfolded, the final act now firmly in place, God's call on your life, please hear this, is to continue this story in the time you have remaining by radically aligning your life purpose with His. That's why you exist. Now, let's move to the personal. You've done great. You've answered the first two questions very well. Let's now move to the, to the second section, the second part of, of this gospel. Having seen how the Bible describes the cosmic good news for all things from the beginning of time in Genesis to the final consummation of God's kingdom in Revelation, let's look now, let's, you know, now we can, it, it, for some of you, I know it's been frustrating because Tim just takes you through verses of the Bible. It's just beautiful. I mean, I, I endorse that. That's the way I normally preach. And you're saying, well, where's the text? And I'm saying, the cosmic gospel, it's like trying to teach the doctrine of the Trinity. It's like trying to teach the person and natures of Christ. It's like trying to teach the inspiration of Scripture. There's not one text. 
This is why we have systematic theology. But now it's time to look at some texts. You ready? And that is, we've looked at this cosmic theme from Genesis to Revelation. Now, now this is what I want you to do. We, we don't have a lot of time, so we'll just do this briefly. We're going to look at the personal good news for you found in the teachings of three key apostles of Jesus. Basically, this is what I want you to do. How would John, the one who most people think was probably closest to Jesus, he described himself as the one who would lean on his breast, how would John answer the question, what is the gospel? That'd be good to hear, wouldn't it? Let's, we're going to look at it. Number two, how would the, you know, the rock the leader of the church? How would Peter, when he preached the gospel for the first time at Pentecost, how would he answer the question? And then, how would the Apostle Paul, uh, the non-fisherman, the scholar, how would he answer the question? Let's look at these very briefly. I've given you texts to show you just that, to give you a glimpse of it. Let's look first at the Apostle John. And I'm praying that God will give you new eyes. I mean, there's nothing like John 3 for people who've been Christians for a long time to get a high yawn factor. <laughs> okay? Look at it with new eyes, and let me remind you of the context. Okay? The Jewish teacher, Nicodemus, was confused. <laughs> this was a confusing time for a lot of Jews. Who Jesus was, what he'd come to do. He knew one thing. Nicodemus knew one thing. Jesus has come to bring the kingdom of God. He'd heard enough, and Jesus was performing miracles showing that the kingdom of God was near. But he was confused about how to be a part of this kingdom so that his enemies and God's enemies would be defeated and he'd be on the, the right side. So he, as a bold, courageous man, he sneaks to Jesus at night. And he comes to Jesus at night to ask him more. That's when Jesus told him, that's the context of the, gospel, of the cosmic gospel. And Jesus tells him, Nicodemus, there's only one way you're going to enter the kingdom. And that is what? You've got to be, if you're going to enter this kingdom that's coming to earth, you've got to be born from above. You've got to be born by this Holy Spirit. You've got to have a whole new heart. And after recording this conversation, John records his summary. Let's look at his answer. The beauty is, it reminds me of the, of the children's answer. <laughs> Jesus loves me. Look at John 3.16. For God, now, that, now notice, this is Father, the Father, triune God. Jesus says here, you know, notice, God the Father so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Now, go deeper here. Like, like maybe you haven't before. Look at this, this promise here in light of this cosmic gospel of creating a new humanity with a new standing of forgiveness, with a new heart of the Spirit and the promise of a new world when Jesus returns? See the new standing. Where's the new standing found here? In the promise that you will not perish. You will not perish. But you will have Notice, the, you will have eternal life. This is so fascinating. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, whenever they talk about the gospel, they're always talking about the kingdom of God. When it gets to the gospel of John, he hardly ever mentions the kingdom of God. He mentions one thing, eternal life, eternal life, life, eternal life. Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written primarily to Jews. John was written to Gentiles, to the Greeks. What you must do is have both the kingdom 
cosmic gospel as well as the personal gospel, eternal life gospel, and never see them separated, but see them integrated. And so, of course, this eternal life was not just life after death in the new world to come, but John makes very clear this eternal life is life that is now that goes forever. Don't ever think of eternal life as life after death. That's not what the Bible means. That's not what John is saying. He's talking eternal life is life that you get now. And that life that will last forever. Here's a quick look at the Apostle John. Now, let's look at the rock. Let's look at Peter. Here again, i got to be careful because I would always do a pop quiz on this one too. Wouldn't you hate me as a professor? <laughs> but uh, I don't know why Tim stuck with me. Okay, but here's the pop quiz. Look up. Don't look at your notes. Don't look at your notes. Look up, look up, look up. Okay, ready? On the day of Pentecost, the apostle Peter, the rock, preached the gospel. And after he preached the gospel, he promised everybody who would repent and be baptized as confirmation of that, that they would receive two gifts from God. Can you name them? Uh-oh, you can see. Notice, notice the text in Acts chapter 2. The first gift, the forgiveness of sins, a new standing before God. The second gift, whoa, you will receive, Peter says, if you will repent, if you will be baptized as confirmation of your repentance and faith, you will receive a double cure. Rock of Ages hadn't even been written yet. You will be saved from God's wrath. You will receive the gift of forgiveness of sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I'm not a singer, but you know Rock of Ages? We're going to end with this. Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Now get ready. Be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its and All I'm saying is, notice the power of the... The gospel is not a single cure gospel. It's not just forgiveness. It's not just a new standing in the righteousness of Christ. It's also the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the truth is, if we were to go back and talk to the hymn writer and, and revise it, upgrade it, it's a triple cure. He promises you a new standing, he pro forgiveness. He promises you a new heart, the Holy Spirit. And when Jesus returns, he promises you what? A whole new world with a whole new body. That's good news. Does Peter really talk about that whole new world? You know our original Bibles don't have chapters and don't have verse numbers? Just move on over into Acts chapter 3, and I dare you to look in Acts chapter 3, and you will see Jesus saying these words. He just continues his message. Jesus, listen, must remain in heaven until the time comes for what? Till the time comes for what? For God to restore everything. There it is. Everything. For God to restore everything as he promised long ago through the holy prophets. In Matthew 19, Jesus called this coming age the new world. And lastly, we've heard, from, we've heard from John, we've heard from the rock, Peter. Now let's move from these two fishermen 
guys that are approachable, guys that will give you a summary. What does the scholar say? What does the apostle Paul say? Well, Paul is not known for simple summaries. Have you picked up, have you picked up on that? <laughs> so what the apostle Paul does is he writes a whole book, a whole letter, the letter to the church at Rome. And he writes to them and he says, I can't, and this is, this is mind-boggling. He, it, it, we can't look at it now because we don't have time, but in Romans chapter 1, Paul doesn't know who planted the church at Rome, and Paul writes to them and says, I've heard about your faith throughout the world, Romans 1.8. You, you are one mature group. I can't wait to get to Rome. Guess why he couldn't wait to get to Rome? To bring to these mature believers at the church at Rome whose faith was known throughout the world, he says, I can't wait to get there to bring you the gospel. Paul, 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 Paul you mean you're going to come here and we're going to bring the gospel to the pagans, right? Oh no, I cannot wait to get to Rome to bring you the gospel. Now, when you see that in Romans 1, verse, uh, from chapter 1 to chapter 5, just like a scholar, he tells them the good news of salvation from the penalty of their sin. This is the good news of justification. He writes, for we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So in chapters 1 through 5, he presents to them the good news of salvation from sin's penalty, a new standing with God. The perfect righteousness of Christ is counted to them through faith. But there's more, like the infomercial. But there's more. In verses 6 and 7, he goes on to say, it's also good news of salvation from sin's dominance. It's the good news that you can have a new heart that's set free. He uses the word redemption. Set free from sin's dominion. He writes the words, this is Paul in Romans 6, we have been set free from sin. Something has happened in our hearts that is broken by God's Spirit. The dominion oh, will always be under its influence. But something has happened. It's broken the dominion. But there's more. In Romans 8, what does Paul go on to say? Not only are we free from the penalty of sin, justification, Romans 1 through 5. Not only are we free from the dominance of sin, chapters 6 and 7. Paul goes on in chapter 8 and says, oh, the good news is even more. We will be free from the very presence of sin all of creation will be saved. Listen, listen to these words. Paul writes, Romans 8, 21, creation itself, not only have you been set free, creation will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Do you see that cosmic gospel? Jesus, John, Peter, Paul, a cosmic good news that has life-changing personal application. Now, with this understanding of a more personal perspective on the gospel from the apostles, let's turn back. I've got to get you ready for the exam. Got to watch the clock, get you ready for the exam. Okay, let's turn back. And let's look at question number three. Let's get you ready for question number three. Okay? Here I want you to realize what are the magnificent personal acts of the triune God that he has done for you? What are those magnificent acts of God, not that he has done for the cosmos, but will you please allow this to come home to your heart now, I am about to bring you good news. Are you ready? I'm going to answer this third final exam question right now using the points in your bulletin. <laughs> Point number one. Please hear this. 
God the Father who created all things, I repeat, created you. And this creator, sovereign creator God, loves you. He loves you so much, the Apostle Paul wrote, that before he created anything, we read it earlier in the worship, he set his love on you before the foundation of the world that you would be adopted as his own, that you would have a loving father in heaven. You are not an accident. God created you to be in this story as a part of his story with all your remaining breath. Number two, this is the bad news. The Bible teaches that when Adam sinned, that sin was rightly regarded by God to be the sin of all his descendants. So when God cursed Adam, the biblical doctrine here is called the imputation of Adam's sin. When God cursed Adam, He cursed you, who he loves. You see, the Bible teaches this, this, this perplexing truth that the creator God is a loving God who does not want to punish you, but because he is holy and because he is just, just like a good judge that might love somebody that comes before him in a court, he must punish sin But the good news, please hear this afresh, is that the Son who redeemed all things in the cosmos, the Son who crushed Satan's head at the cross, died for you. You know what that means? The curse that God put on you And me. He took on himself. The gospel is astonishing when you go deeper. That God satisfied his own justice. He satisfied himself by substituting himself. That's the core meaning of the cross. Self-satisfaction through self-substitution. It is amazing grace. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He suffered the full wrath and punishment of God that you deserve because of your sin so that you would never and could never experience it. No such thing as double jeopardy in God's court. But there's more. Not only did the Son redeem you, you whom the Father loves and created, reversing reversing the curse on you, taking it on himself, but the Spirit who was poured out on Pentecost, God promises to pour out in your heart and cause you to have life, to be born from above, and to have the washing of regeneration to restore you to God, give you eternal life. And notice this condition, if you will repent and believe. This leads us to the fourth question. We're getting toward the end. What is the good news about what God promises you if you will repent and believe? What is the good news? This fourth question is critical. So critical, I put the answer there on your cheat sheet. The good news is that the Father loves you so much that he gave his only Son to redeem you and he promises to give you his Holy Spirit to restore you and give you eternal life. Notice this. Notice if you have a pen or a pencil, circle the word if. If you will repent and believe in the gospel. So I want us to spend this final section 
expounding our answer to the final question. What does it mean to meet this condition? How to repent and believe in the good news. You see, when Jesus, look again, look again at Jesus' first proclamation of the gospel in the first gospel, the gospel of Mark. Mark was written before Matthew. He proclaimed the gospel of God, and then look at the second part of that proclamation. Then he commanded everyone who hears this message to repent and to believe it. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Here's our final question. How are you obeying Jesus' command to repent and believe in the good news? And I'm talking about you as somebody, most of you here, who are already converted. You've gone through the gate. What does it mean for you? to keep repenting and believing in the gospel. I mean, there's a lot of confusion today about how to obey Jesus' command to repent and believe. Repentance and faith are presented to us in Scripture as two dynamics of, of what has sometimes been called, I think Tim Keller uses this, it's a, a spiritual combustion cycle in the human heart that begins at your conversion and continues to work in the hearts of forgiven Christians at all times, changing you into the image of Christ. Look how the scholar brings it down to where most of us really live. Look at what the Apostle Paul says. I mean, could it get much more simple than this? Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, I love this, so walk in him. How did you receive him? By repentance and faith. How do you walk in him? By repentance and faith. This is rocket science. I just love the scholar lands the plane. And let me tell you, when this spiritual combustion cycle of ongoing repentance and faith is at work in your heart as a forgiven follower of Christ, let me tell you something, there will always be change. The reverse is also true. When there is no change in your heart or life, it's almost certain that this ongoing cycle of repentance and faith is not taking place. You see, the problem is, that most people think of repentance as something, something rare, something that's reserved for those few times when we do something really bad. Ask somebody sometimes. I would always do this with students. When's the last time you repented? Oh, you're thinking about when I did something really bad. It's got to be a huge sin. This view of repentance reflects how so few Christians today understand the first thesis of Martin Luther's 95 theses that he nailed to the Wittenberg door. There was another pop quiz. I would say, okay, I'd have about 60 or 70 students, first-year students, first time to ever be at seminary, and I would say to them, uh, okay, how many of you have ever heard of the Reformation? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I've heard of it, heard of it. Okay, how many of you ever heard of Martin Luther? Mm -hmm. Everybody heard of Martin Luther. How many of you ever heard of the 95 theses that he nailed to the Wittenberg door that actually was the spark that lit the flame of the Protestant Reformation, that renewal that has come today? How many of you have ever heard of the 95 theses? Mm -hmm. Seminary is going to be real easy. Mm -hmm. Okay? Then, then, who here? I'm not going to, this is not a trick question. I'm not going to ask you thesis number 72. Thesis number 41. All I want you to do, you reformed theologues and hermeneutes, just who here among you will tell me the first one? Just the first one. Every year, for 22 years. Everybody's going down low. Here's the first one. Look at this. When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, repent, repent, he willed the entire life of believers to be one of repentance. You see, this understanding of repentance as an ongoing daily way of life, it's almost unknown today. You see, we need to rediscover 
that true biblical repentance doesn't lead to despair, it leads to joy. It's only when we first learn the depth of our sin can we learn the depth of God's grace. Did you ever wonder why the death of Jesus is not more spiritually radioactive to you? Why it's not more meaningful to you? Why you can't quite connect with the Apostle Paul, I boast in the cross, I find my life in the cross. You see, the cross of Christ can only be deeply precious for daily repenters who see the depth of their sin. Martin Luther was a crude old guy, and I loved the way he would often put things that you could, you could remember. Martin Luther, would, Martin Luther uh, would say, if you see yourself, this is a paraphrase, you see yourself as a little sinner, guess how you're going to see Jesus? Little Savior. If you see yourself as a big sinner, guess how you'll see Jesus? Amen. As a big Savior. See, when Jesus calls us to repent, He's not calling us to beat up on ourselves or merely try to clean up our lives. He's calling us to a radical change of heart by recognizing the depth of our sin. And that root problem is a problem of the heart. And the reason our hearts are not more transformed is because we have allowed the affections of our hearts to be captured by idols. And the modern idols that capture our hearts' affections today are not the graven images of the ancient world. You know what an idol is? An idol is something or someone other than Jesus Christ that is your true source of happiness and fulfillment. It's something from which you get your sense of core identity and worth. For some of us, I struggle with this one a lot, it's the approval of other people. For some, it's your reputation. For some, it's your success. For others, it's comfort or control. For some, it's pleasure. For some, it's power. For some, it's possessions. For some, it's sex or money or relationships. Did you know idols can even be good causes? Like making an impact for Jesus can be an idol? Having a happy, godly home, having a good marriage, having obedient children? Those can be idols. Calvin said, when you understand your heart, you'll understand that it is an idol factory. And whatever it is, Without this bottom line, you believe your life is meaningless. Do you know that whatever you really live, live for, if you get in touch with what you really live for, what you really look to for your security, what you really look to for your significance, do you know it has frightening power over you? If someone blocks your idol from you, that's why you will get enraged with anger. If your idols are threatened, you can be paralyzed with fear. If you lose your idol, you can be driven into despair. This is because your idols give you your deepest sense of significance and security. So repentance doesn't involve behavioral modification or getting together in a small group and sticking each other with forks. Bad, bad, bad. It involves turning away the affections of your heart from the things you look to other than Jesus for life. So that, and we come in for a landing now, last point of the last point, which answers the last final question. And that is, we turn our affections away from idols in repentance, don't miss this, so that we can place those same affections by faith onto the resurrected and ascended Christ as the only source of ultimate security and satisfaction and joy. That's what it means to believe. Faith in the gospel is the mysterious means that God ordains through which, going back to the beginning, the power of Jesus' victory as your king is meant to flow in and through your life. 
This is how God means for you to find the streams of living water that John talks about, that Jesus talked about. When he said, hear these words of Jesus. If anyone thirsts, see it's quenching our thirst in things other than God that is idolatry. Tap into this for what real faith is. Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, basically stop drinking from all the broken sewer water cisterns. Come to me, come to me, repent Turn your, your thirst quenching that'll never quench your thirst in other sources and come to me. Whoever believes in me, the Greek is literally, whoever keeps believing in me, as the scripture says, watch this, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Are you thirsty? Hear God's voice now as we come in for a land. Hear God's voice. You're not here by accident. Hear God's voice calling you to turn away from your idols that he has brought to your mind in repentance and begin drinking deeply from the well that is Christ by faith. And as you learn to keep drinking deeply from this well that is Christ, Hear Jesus' promise. He promises you here that you will experience, if you keep drinking, three steps forward, two steps back, that's the Christian life. That's why we have to keep repenting every day. If you keep repenting and keep drawing back to Him, keep pulling your affections off of your idols and placing them onto Him, Jesus makes a promise to you that you will not only have your deep thirst quenched, but streams of living water will flow through you. In the time remaining, as you radically realign your story with God's. I told you last week, I love the fact that Tim carries on the tradition of quoting these old dead Puritan guys. I want to end with one of my favorite, who wrote one of the hymns, The Fountain Filled with Blood, his name is William Cooper, pronounced Cooper. This is a prayer I want to join you in that I continue to pray. Please make it from your heart. Do you see the prayer? Let me read it. The dearest idol I have known, whatever that idol be, help me, O oh God, triune God, to tear it from thy throne and worship only thee. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by your Spirit, grant us grace as we bow before you and make this ancient prayer our prayer. Lord, the dearest idol that I have known, whatever that idol be, help me, O oh God, help me, O oh God, to tear it from your throne that I might worship only thee. Our gracious God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by your Holy Spirit, draw us near in our pain, our suffering, our brokenness, our unquenched thirst for more than this world can give us. And give to us, even now, the gifts of repentance and faith that we might draw near to you now and that we might keep drawing near to our living, reigning King Jesus in repentance and faith drinking from the well that never runs dry, and find in him by your spirit new life, new standing, new heart as we await the new world when Jesus returns.